Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sanjay Kumar, and I am the cybersecurity researcher from Finland. I'm, I'm the moderator of this session. Welcome to the IEEE Computer Society DVP SYP virtual conference on hot topics in cybersecurity, second day. This session is on dealing with the cyber attack. The conference is brought to you by Distinguished Visitors Program and the Students and Young Professionals Activities Committee. The Student and the Young Committee Professionals Activities Committee was developed to support the Computer Society students and young professionals globally through the initiatives targeted at advancing their knowledge, development, and careers. The Distinguished Visitor Program was initiated in 1971 by Dr. Stephen Yao and offers top quality speakers to professionals and student chapters. Before we get started, I would like to get a couple of housekeeping tasks out of the way. You can ask your questions in Q&A panel. Dr. Mead and Dr. Kumar will answer as many questions as they can following the presentation. The session is being recorded and the slides and recording will be made available after the session. Please allow me now welcome our speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Mead. Dr. Nancy Mead is a fellow of Software Engineering Institute and adjunct professor of the Software Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Her research areas are security requirements, engineering, and software assurance curricula. Dr. Nancy Mead Award for Excellence in Software Engineering Education is named for her. Prior to joining the SEI, Mead was a senior technical staff member at IBM Federal Systems where she spent most of her career in development and management of large real-time systems. She also worked in IBM Software Engineering Technology area and managed I IBM Federal Systems Software Engineering Education Department. Mead has more than 150 publications and invited presentations. Welcome, Dr. Mead. Let me now pass floor to you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I think it's worth mentioning that I did not know that uh, Dr. Yao had initiated this program. He and I have uh, interacted many times, especially at the Comp CompSAC conference, which he was also and has been instrumental in for many years. Uh, so it's nice to know that he's been involved in so many important professional activities. Uh, I'm also delighted to be here with all of you. Uh, I know that you are all um, happy to be engaged and at the same time staying well and safe. So with that, let's get started. Today, I'm going to be talking about a threat modeling research to a large extent and to a smaller extent machine learning because that is a much more recent topic than threat modeling. Uh, my interest from, as you can tell from the introduction, has been with the early parts of the software engineering life cycle, specifically requirements engineering. So my interest in threat modeling was focused on how we get threat modeling into those very early activities, uh, specific, specifically requirements engineering, because my focus is on prevention of attacks we tend to look at it in terms of prevention, um, detection, dealing with actually dealing with a, an attack that's ongoing and then recovering from it. So I'm going to be looking at the prevention side of things. With that, we've got five topics, but they really can be reduced to two. The first three are all about threat modeling, research that was done uh, while I was at the Software Engineering Institute from which I'm now uh, retired. And then the second set of activities will be focused on work that uh, I did at Carnegie Mellon with some students on machine learning, and then some future activities trying to marry the two areas together, threat modeling and machine learning. So with that, 
uh, I'd like to ask you a question, and you'll see that we do that here and there during the presentation. If you could indicate whether you are a student, practitioner, researcher, or a teacher, that would be helpful. Thank you. And then the second, I'll go on to see what kind of answers we got. Okay, let's see what you all had to say. So, uh, we've got a good group of students, which I really enjoy. Uh, a lot of practitioners, which is also excellent. Some researchers and also some teachers. And uh, I've done all of those things, so I can really relate to that. So, um, that helps me to uh, calibrate talks sometimes, although since We've got so many groups represented, it's going to be a little bit harder to do here. So going on, uh, I want to talk about what we mean by threat modeling. If you're familiar with it, this will just give you some def different definitions to consider. Uh, and if you're not, maybe it'll help you a little bit. So we have um, three definitions that we used in our research. The first is uh, working up from the bottom, actually. Microsoft was uh, an early developer of threat modeling, and they defined it as a repeatable process to find and address all threats to your product. The second definition, again, working up from the bottom, is one that we developed in conjunction with Ford and uh, I worked with them in a collaborative way about mm, 10 years ago when they would just becoming aware of the idea of threat modeling. Uh, they in turn were working with Microsoft and so their definition is threat modeling is both a methodology and a tool used to identify vulnerabilities that would result in adverse business impact. So their primary concern at the time was with business impact. And then the third definition, which is the one that we used in our research, uh, is a little larger. A threat modeling method is an approach for creating an abstraction of a software system aimed at identifying attackers' abilities and goals and trying to generate and mitigate possible threats that the system must mitigate. So uh, bear with me for just a second. Sorry about that little distraction. So having looked at those definitions, and indeed you may have your own definition if you've been doing threat modeling, who does it? Well, obviously vendors do it. Microsoft was one of the earlier ones. They did it in conjunction with the security push and uh, continuing entire security development life cycle. Uh, they use a method called Stride and make it freely available. We'll be talking about that in a good bit more detail. Uh, government organizations that I've worked with over many years in my career use it uh, for the DOD and these days probably also for Department of Homeland Security. It's mandated and I suspect the same is true in many other countries and regions as well. Now. Uh, not all of these folks are cybersecurity experts. 
Uh, so they are using various methods. Some are using uh, National Institute's uh, standards. Um, some are using ISO standards, and some are using checklists, which allow you to select um, methods without having that expertise. In addition, uh, clearly commercial industries such as automotive, finance, and so on, are also uh, doing threat modeling. There are various methods in use, including stride risk analysis pro approaches, octave attack trees, and so on. So here we have another polling question. Do you do threat modeling? And that's an easy one to answer, yes or no. And that will also help me get an idea of our audience. Uh, so yes, about 20% and no, about 80%, which is interesting. Um, I can understand that some of the students don't do it, but I would have thought that more of the practitioners were doing it right now. However, uh, perhaps you're not necessarily the one who's responsible for it and you're just trying to learn about it. That's great too. So with that in mind, <clears throat> let's consider Microsoft's reasons. Why did they do it? Well, they wanted software that was secure. They had a lot of legacy software and uh, they were really challenged to try to make that software secure and then take what they had learned and transfer it to new software that was under development. Uh, another reason that they did it is because uh, attackers think differently. Very often, uh, those of us in the field will hear the phrase, think like an attacker. So your, your attacker is not your normal user of your system. It's a user, but not one that you want to have. And, and then finally, it allows you to predictably and effectively find software problems early in the life cycle. Now, a lot of the Microsoft work was focused on uh, architecture and design and then actual code. Again, because they already had a large code base, um, my interest has been at that very early point when you're thinking about requirements. So some of their work doesn't fit quite so well with my interests, even though it's really important. Uh, threat modeling and identifying vulnerabilities is not a one-time thing. It's something that has to continue throughout the software development and operational process. So our first research took place in 2015 and 16. That was at the Software Engineering Institute where I was a part of a team. We decided that we would focus on the, bear with me for a second folks, I'll be right back. Well, Sanjay and I have had a lot of perceived threats in our homes that our dogs are trying to protect us from, even though we don't really need it right now. Uh, so with that little problem taken care of, I hope that we can go on without any uh, further disruption. So back to our software engineering and threat modeling research. Since we are were at the Software Engineering Institute, our focus was on software. Uh, threat modeling can be much broader. It can encompass uh, hardware and firmware, but we were focused on software development, specifically, specifically the early life cycle activities. Uh, and our proposal was to evaluate 
some competing threat modeling methods. Because the data that we had seen indicated that threat modeling helped, uh, but we really had no idea if any of these methods were in some regard better than any other ones. And um, we also didn't know whether some threat modeling methods were better in certain domains than others. That, that was kind of a secondary focus. Our primary focus was to look at a few methods and determine if one of them was the best or not, as the case may be. There, at that time, there were about five methods. So I think this is five years ago. Um, now there are at least 12 that I'm aware of. So the three that we picked um, aren't necessarily all of them, uh, although we thought they were representative at that point in time. So we studied three methods. I'll be talking about these in a little more detail. Uh, the first was STRIDE, which at the time represented the state of the practice. Uh, Microsoft developed a method and a tool to go with it and makes it freely available. <clears throat> they also have a workshop material that they will provide and videos, all of which you can find online on the Microsoft website. Uh, so that was really a big service to the community. In addition, they collected their own data to show that the amount of patching that they had to do after they implemented all of their lifecycle practices, including Stride, was greatly reduced afterwards, as was, of course, the number of vulnerabilities. So Microsoft was an obvious choice. We picked two others, and we were able to get some team members who were at the institutes where those were developed. One is security cards. That was developed at University of Washington, and it's a kind of a structured brainstorming technique. It's a card game, and so it has a great deal of appeal to uh, students, which was one of the reasons that we picked it. Now, what we did find later on is that the card game didn't resonate quite as well with our, our um, government customers because it was um, just a little too light in terms of their viewpoint, although the results could be very good. The third one is called Persona Non Grata. Uh, that was developed at DePaul University and uh, based on previous ideas and principles in human-computer interaction. So these were the three that we picked. Uh, we put together a team that included folks from the security cards and PNG community. Uh, we also were in contact with uh, both Microsoft and um, Ford Motor Company because we wanted to make sure that we, what we were doing was in sync. At Ford, they had developed a lightweight version uh, that we had written some papers about, and uh, we decided that would be good for our purposes. So let's first take a look at the stride approach. So you can see it's 20 years old. It's been around. and. Um, it's held up very well. A lot of things have been refined, but the basic method has uh, held up really well. The idea is that you model the system with data flow diagrams. So here, here, that's your first indication that you're probably talking about at least an architecture, if not a design. If you have a data flow diagram, clearly you know something about that system. And again, thinking about where Microsoft was, they could be producing data flow diagrams from existing software, no problem doing that. They then um, map the data flow diagram to threat categories, and the threat categories that they are interested in are spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of, of privilege. Um, there are corresponding security 
properties. So the idea is once you've identified the threat, you can figure out a mitigation strategy to get you to the security property that you want. You can do this manually, but it's a lot of work. Uh, or you can do it using the free threat modeling tool. Well, that's a no-brainer. Who wouldn't want to use a free tool as opposed to doing a bunch of work by hand? Uh, the tool has evolved. Um, the earlier version required some understanding of cybersecurity uh, and software development. Uh, some of the later versions are allow the user to be at a, a higher level of abstraction. So the user doesn't have to have as much cybersecurity expertise, which is good because many organizations don't have that expertise in-house. Now, in this diagram, this gives you an idea of the data flow diagrams that they used as input. We're not going to focus on the details of this. What's of interest here are what they call elements because we're going to see them again in just a minute. Uh, a rectangle is an external entity. A circle is a process. Parallel lines are data stores and uh, arrows indicate data flow. So each element in the data flow diagram is identified that way. And then additionally, this is really important, there's a dashed line that indicates a trust boundary. Now, we all know about system boundaries, but the idea of a trust boundary was introduced because Microsoft was especially concerned about what happens when you cross that boundary. Where can you go from there? How could you possibly uh, disrupt the network? So with that in mind, um, it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of a cookie cutter approach, which again, makes it easier. They talk about how the different kinds of threats affect each element type. And the question mark um, is because data stores can occur in several different ways. And therefore you might have to consider several different scenarios in terms of the threats that could affect them. But again, this is nicely laid out. Uh, you don't have to do any work. In fact, they counsel you at this level not to do additional work because you're just making more work for yourself. And then for themselves, so this is strictly for Microsoft applications. For, for your applications, you could have a completely different set of mitigations. So they have um, the threat, the quality that you want to get to, and then an indicator of how you might do it. Again, for Microsoft applications, not necessarily for yours. Uh, and that actually goes beyond some of the other methods that we looked at. Um, some of them are purely focused on, on threats with mitigation being kind of a separate step. So the stride method was nice in that regard because it, it gives you all three components. The second approach is the security cards approach. I mentioned that this was developed at uh, University of Washington. We had uh, some of the faculty on our, our team. Um, the cards can be freely downloaded from their website and I believe there are also videos and some tutorial information on the site. It's also possible uh, for a fee to order a set of cards uh, from their bookstore. Uh, and the, uh, the download is, I believe, subject to a Creative Commons agreement, which is, of course, no big deal. And the cards support a structured brainstorming session so that the brainstorming is not all over the map. You have things that, that you can focus on. So each card, uh, I don't have it in my notes, but I think there are 42 cards in the deck and there are four suits. 
just as they would be in a real card deck, but fewer cards. Um, there's a topic, a dimension that covers the attacker's motivations, resources, and methods. That's the front of the card. And then on the back of the card is some information that can give you more detail to help in structuring the brainstorming and um, some reference material as well. So it's a nice little package. If you're uh, teaching, it's a great way for students to get into the topic. And um, if you're working, it's something that you can easily try out with your team. When you're in that very early stage, you don't have to have requirements. Um, at that point, you certainly don't need an architecture, but you can still talk about the threats and how you would deal with them. The third approach is called persona non grata. Um, again, developed at DePaul University, uh, documented, as far as I can recall, they don't have a tool, uh, but it's been documented in several research reports and papers. It builds on the idea of a persona, which is uh, used very heavily in software development for product, commercial products uh, in place of actual users. So their detailed descriptions of imaginary people using data that's understood about real people with the objective of trying to learn how they might use a system. Here's an example persona. Um, a retired accountant wants to be with his grandchildren, likes to read the paper, work in his garden, and stay in touch with his friends. Technology's okay, but only if it doesn't get in, in the way. So if you had that persona, you might speculate, well, does he need something to manage his financial accounts? Um, does he want resources for his gardening? Uh, is he interested in social networking to stay in touch with his friends? Uh, and you could use this persona to reason about him. Now, a persona non grata is a user of a system that you don't want, a potential attacker. We were able to use that idea to come up with a set of items to consider. The motivations of the attacker, their goals, skills, and finally, uh, misuse cases, just the opposite of the use cases that you would consider for a persona. So the question, these are the questions you would want to answer using, uh, using their methods. We've got a real live example here, and this is a pretty dramatic case. This actually happened. It was a uh, contractor working on a SCADA system in Australia, it was controlling, the system was controlling sewage equipment. And uh, after leaving the contractor organization, he applied for a government job and got rejected. So he decided to get even by trying to cause raw sewage to leak and creating a backlash against the contractor and the municipality. You'll see he got he got pretty far, but eventually he got caught. So he had really good skills because he had been a contractor on the system. Um, he knew the SCADA equipment. He knew how to get into it. All he needed was to get control. That's in some regard. There are a lot of ways to do it, but here's one. Steal the computer equipment. Use it to construct, construct a fake control station from which to send signals. Uh, gain remote access, once again, since he knew the internals of the system, he could figure out how to do that. Disable the alarms and instruct the pumping stations to release sewage, which certainly is not what we want. So he got caught. Um, we had an easy time constructing this because it was an existing case. Obviously, if it's a theoretical attacker, it's a little bit harder, but the idea is to focus on all four of those elements 
the description of what the attacker looks like, their goals, skills, and then finally uh, developing the misuse case for how they get there. So with that, for the um, 20 or so percent of folks that do threat modeling, have you used any of these methods? Or if not, have you used another method? I'll wait just a second to let you fill that in. Okay, so no surprise here. Wow, 40% using Stride. Quite a few people using security cards, um, which makes me wonder if some of my collaborators or their former students are actually on this uh, video conference and 40% other. So for the other, let us know what you use. I'm not sure if it actually will come up here, but it'll be interesting to see in any case. And maybe in the Q&A session or in the chat session, um, you could let us know what those methodologies are. There are quite a number. There are some that are actually part of complete life cycle methods. And then what we found in our study was that uh, some of the professional modelers uh, didn't actually use the, the defined method. They used their own experience and intuition. So with that in mind, let's talk about what we did. We had a pretty good size group, 250, quote, subjects or students. They consisted of undergraduate and graduate students at three universities. Um, they could either be novice learners in software engineering or cybersecurity. They could be returning practitioners, um, or they could be professionals. We used a team, well, not a team, is a set of individual threat modelers, people who did it for a living as a control group, because we wanted to compare what the students came up with working in teams with what the professionals came up with. We had two uh, test beds that we used. One was a drone swarm. Um, so that's the one on the left, uh, unmanned autonomous vehicle with a, a lead drone. And then the other one was an aircraft maintenance scenario. Both of those were um, of interest, especially once again to our government customers. And it's clear that they would both be very important in terms of trying to avoid uh, an attack. We taught two out of the three methods to each team. And what we did was to change the order so that the fact that they knew one method for one case study wouldn't necessarily help them with the other one. So for example, if one team did stride and then security cards, we would swap it around. So another team did security cards and then stride. And the, uh, the examples, the test beds are also um, documented in one of our reports. So we had a number of results. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in, in detail. Again, it's in our reports. Um, unfortunately, we did not get the result that we were hoping for. Maybe that's a good thing. We did not find that any of the three methods was completely superior to the others. Uh, so among teams, we found quite a bit of variation in stride. Uh, security cards found a lot of threat types, but also had quite a bit of variation. Uh, PNG was a little more focused, probably because you're thinking about 
attackers first, as opposed to all the attacks that could occur. So that was more focused, but it also resulted in um, a narrower set of results. And uh, compared to the professional threat modelers, no single method led to teams re reporting a majority of the actual threats. So that wasn't exactly what we were hoping for, although I, I guess a negative result is still a good result. Um, and then we, looked, we tried to look at efficiency and effectiveness. One of the things that you don't want, you don't want to uh, miss threats that could actually occur. On the other hand, you don't want to identify a bunch of potential threats that will either never occur or are very unlikely because then you've just wasted everybody's time. And, and in the real world, we're not talking about uh, student exercise, we're talking about time in the workplace um, that people don't have a lot of. So we didn't get the results that we wanted. Now, we did find some interesting contrasts between the methods and then we did a, a further study uh, with just with persona non grata that um, produced an interesting analysis result and that's documented in one of our papers. But we did follow on to say, well, if, neither, if none of these methods was really superior, could we perhaps combine them in some way um, to get a better product? And that was our subsequent smaller research project, which I'll get to in, in just a second. So here we've got the overall impressions, which I already talked about. And then finally, the fact that perhaps merging uh, security cards and PNG with a little bit of stride would give us a, a better picture. Again, since our focus was on requirements, um, security cards and PNG were a little more in our swim lane for that purpose than Stride. So this was a study that took place in the next two years between 2017 and 18. Uh, in that study, we were working with some collaborators elsewhere. We weren't working with students other than some graduate students who were on the project with us. Uh, and we actually applied the method initially in a small case study and then a variant on the method in a, a real project. So first we considered what the desirable characteristics might be of a threat modeling method. We don't want to identify threats that don't exist. On the other hand, we don't want to overlook threats um, we want to get consistent results regardless of who's doing the modeling. So we'd like to flatten out the experience factor as much as we can. Um, we want it to be cost effective because one of the things that we discovered early on is that um, companies and large organizations don't have time to get 50 people in a room for a bunch of meetings to talk about threat modeling. It's not going to happen. So it's got to be cost effective and we've got to be able to minimize the time of those stock top stakeholders so that we're not keeping them trapped in meetings when they should be off doing other things. And then finally, we want some evidence. The reason we started the research in the first place was because we didn't have any evidence that any particular method uh, was going to give the best results. We additionally came up with some other considerations uh, and the reference on the bottom is uh, still out there. I checked that yesterday, so you can take a look at that too. Um, the slides are going to be made available after the session, so you'll have them on hand. So at a high level, here was the initial method we assumed that it was going to fit into a larger requirements engineering process. <laughs> and since I was the um, principal 
investigator for development of the square process for security requirements engineering. It's no surprise that I used my own process uh, as the larger process that we might try to fit into. But I think it could fit into um, any security requirements engineering process, and there are now quite a few of them out here. So the first thing that you need before starting is information about the system. Um, we then picked up, and you can see from the key on the right side, uh, security cards is shown in pink, PNG, and green in terms of how it influenced our method, and then stride in blue. So the idea was that we would do some initial brainstorming and then prune the unlikely cases, continue, and come up with a, a set of threats and scenarios. Now, it's worth noticing that this does not consider mitigation strategies. Uh, mitigation strategies would come in uh, a later step outside of this threat modeling method. So in that regard, using something like stride, for example, uh, even though it tends to occur later in the process, it does have the advantage of uh, giving you the mitigations as part of the activity. In any case, here's what we developed for the sake of trying to identify the best aspects of the methods that we had looked at and having something that we could do further experiments with. We applied it to both a small case study as a proof of concept and then to a real world uh, medium sized project. We had to uh, tailor the method to fit the interests of the project managers. That's both the advantage and disadvantage of a real project is that the project managers are interested in their project. Uh, your method and how well it serves the purpose is not precisely what they're interested in. They're not interested in your research results. They want to know what is it going to do for me on my project now. So we got feedback on the tailored method, um, but we couldn't come up with more general conclusions from that single case study. One of the things that we'd like to do and I is certainly still on my agenda is to uh, apply this to some additional case studies, possibly with students, or to apply it to additional real projects if that opportunity would present itself. I think that would be great and a good uh, next step for this approach. So with that, we've talked about the first three topics which were focused purely on threat modeling. Now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about machine learning, uh, starting with a student project that occurred in 2018 at Carnegie Mellon. It was a set of master's students in information technology and security. So the next few slides that you'll see um, address that project. But first, we have another poll. So we learned who was working in threat modeling. I want to find out who's working in machine learning. Nobody. All right. Perhaps because it's such a big area in the future. And if yes, are you doing threat modeling? Well, I guess that doesn't matter since nobody's working on machine learning. But that means that this is a good time to talk about what you might do if you started working in machine learning. So the student project wanted to assess the robustness. I should preface this by saying, um, this was a short project with a small number of students. So we knew that we weren't going to end up with a commercial product that we could use or even um, a huge set of research results. It was a start. Uh, and the students wanted to assess the robustness of machine learning models relative to 
adversarial activities. This example is used in almost every talk on machine learning. Uh, there are a number of references for it. There's a valid reference on the bottom of my slide, but you might find other references just as well. And this has to do, if you think about um, recognition, what, what's happening in robotic cars, automation, you want a stop sign, for example, to be able to be recognized as a stop sign. And part of the issue is that you can make changes to imaging that will cause objects to be incorrectly identified. In this example, you've got a photo of a panda, but by changing some number of bits in the database, you can cause that photo to be recognized as a given. In a similar fashion, you can take a stop sign and by making some number of changes, cause the software in the automobile to recognize it as something else and maybe cause the car to go zipping right through the stop sign. Not so good. At that time, again, this was 2018, there was not much in the way of security frameworks over the last couple of years that's uh, changed quite a bit, but this was early experimentation. So people need to make sure their models are robust enough to stay safe uh, from that kind of interference. They found uh, a few databases that were interesting and um, they were able to come up with a tool that allowed both the databases and uh, the adversarial activities to be considered uh, relative to one another. So the goal was to build a website that would allow users to input their models, their machine learning models, and then test them against adversarial examples uh, using computer vision as the set of tasks. And then for the website to evaluate and provide feedback about robustness of the models and what kind of attacks might take place uh, using a particular uh, library called CleverHunts and the ImageNet data set. They were able to uh, produce a tool I'm going to move down a couple of slides. And um, the result was that we had a set of functional requirements and constraints. One of the constraints the students faced was that they had a limited budget and um, they want to provide it something that was free to the users. Uh, they, that also meant that they didn't have a lot of storage available. Uh, so they focused on using things that were free and that didn't take up a lot of space. So that caused some technical constraints as well. It worked pretty well, but it was very much uh, of a student pro project with a student prototype as a result. It didn't become a commercial um, product, but it, it provided some good ideas that were actually input to our machine learning researchers. So looking at everything that we did in both threat modeling and machine learning, we learned that there was no single best method for threat modeling. We produced a hybrid method, documented it in our reports and in some papers, and provided it to a small example and then the medium size customer system. Uh, and then we completed the student project on machine learning, which was used to inform other machine learning research projects. In my references that are in the slides at the very end, you'll see there's been a lot more work on machine learning uh, and adverse circumstances. Um, and I recommend that 
you take a look at some of those. My goal is to try to do some further research marrying the threat modeling idea with the machine learning idea. So I'd like to apply threat modeling methods to systems that will employ machine learning and especially do it, first of all, see whether it works at the requirements level and then try to understand which ones are effective. A lot of the machine learning work that's focusing on security uh, presumes that you already have a system. And so it's very specific to exi one, existing systems or two systems that are much further along in development um, than the requirement stage. At this point, I'm not even sure that uh, threat modeling for machine learning can be done effectively at the requirement stage. But it's an opportunity for collaboration with uh, student teams and practitioners, and I'd love to be able to do some of that. Uh, a second idea is reversing it and asking the question of whether machine learning can be used to improve threat modeling. So if we looked at existing research on machine learning, could we focus on a particular domain, uh, perhaps something from a, a prior example, and learn uh, how we could improve threat modeling using a machine learning activity? Uh, a third idea, not on my slide set, was whether we could use machine learning in conjunction with uh, education. And um, that's an idea that we haven't really developed far enough to even make a proposal. So with that, um, let's summarize. We talked about threat modeling, our experiments, what we learned and what we didn't learn, our subsequent uh, hybrid threat modeling tool. We did a little bit of work on machine learning and there's a lot more going on now. Uh, and my future activities, I'd like to focus on trying to a, do more with threat modeling, and B, um, see what I can do with a combination of threat modeling and machine learning. With that, I want to mention some resources that are available to you. This uh, slide, which you will have, is um, focused on the hybrid threat modeling method and also the results from the prior threat modeling study, all of that is wrapped into this. Um, additionally, there is a, a, a course that is available from the Software Engineering Institute. It's a certificate program. Of course, that's uh, free for service, whereas um, all these other, I should say fee for service, all these other downloads are free. These are the references for the student project on machine learning. And then there, are, so these are the students' references. And then finally, here are a bunch of references for machine learning. I would recommend working from the bottom up. There is a recent webinar that I looked at um, from the Software Engineering Institute that's available for free, uh, Threats for Machine Learning by Mark Sherman. There is also uh, a blog post, once again, available for free. And in addition, Gary McGraw, who's well known in the software security area, um, now has uh, an institute called Berryville Research Institute, I believe, that's developed the top 10 risks. And they've also done some architectural analysis for machine learning to try to understand the risks. So, so there's a lot that's available. Some of it uh, can be pretty mathematical, but not all of it. So with that, we can move on to your questions and some discussion. I'll be glad to take a break while we find out what's happening. Thank you, Dr. Meg, for your presentation. And I cannot see any questions from the audience. OK, so here is one. So I'm pushing it to the slide area so you can see it. Uh, let's, yeah. Okay. So you can 
see the question on the slide. So I can read it. An older system where security was an issue is now being more automated. Can Stride be used on the present system to help the factor, the software to close up vulnerabilities where security requirements are now required to be implemented? So I would say that Stride can certainly be used because most likely you'll have data flow diagrams. Again, keeping in mind that Microsoft was working with existing systems when they developed Stride. Um, they also developed uh, some other methods that can be used at the code level to do code analysis. And um, one in particular is called attack surface that, that looks more specifically at code. Those could be used as well, requires um, more engineering background than Stride, but I'd advise taking a look at, at that. Now, the security requirements that you're implementing may require additional software to be developed. Um, that'll, that'll become clear when you see the results of the analysis using Stride and, and possibly attack surface, uh, and then what those new requirements are. When I first started working in the security requirements area, we were not looking at existing systems, we were looking at new systems. And so we were looking at it in a top-down way, whereas with an older system, you're gonna go bottom-up and also top-down if you've identified additional requirements. Maybe that prompted some other questions. Yeah, so the next question you can see on your slides. So do you have any recommendation for machine learning? Mm, for studying it, I would, I would say, um, again, the Software Engineering Institute has quite a bit of information, as does uh, Gary McGraw's latest effort which is called Berryville. Our, our publications by IEEE and also by ACM have a lot on machine learning. I'm less familiar with machine learning educational offerings, but that's uh, something that I could look into. My very last slide, which I'll get to at the end of this, is my contact information. And so, um, Glad to hear from anyone that wants to ask me further questions and, and start a, a dialogue because I'm not sure if I've answered this one completely. Okay, so let's go to the next question. What do I need to implement machine learning to my research? Can machine learning be used to detect malicious fog node behaviors? Hmm. I have to do some research myself to be able to answer that question. So if the person asking it will send me the question uh, to my email, which I'm gonna bring up here. Okay. I will do my best. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, gonna, push, I'm gonna push this for just a second, Sanjay, so that yeah. uh, people can see my contact information yeah, and sure. especially the email at the bottom. And that'll also be in the slides that you get. Sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Yeah, so uh, as a cybersecurity researcher in machine learning, so I would like to ask a uh, question from you as well. Like, are you going to use uh, machine learning for threat modeling or threat modeling to secure the machine learning? Our initial focus was on um, threat modeling to secure the machine learning. Okay. And then, and then we said, okay, we could also turn it around. Yeah. And use okay. machine learning to improve the threat modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm not <laughs> sure. The, the first question uh, is the one that I was unsure about, whether or not threat modeling makes sense at the requirements level for machine learning applications. S since so much of the research that I've seen is focused later on, I'm not sure if I'm even trying yeah. to answer yeah. a sensible question. Yeah. Okay, so our next question from the audience is, is the mid attack framework considered a threat modeling tool? Um, there are several uh, frameworks out there and uh, NIST also has some, some frameworks. They can definitely be used to support threat modeling. And um, the frameworks that we see published tend to think about categories of attacks and ask the users to select controls. So yes, um, they can be used. They have the advantage that you don't need to be an expert on threat modeling in order to use them. Um, sometimes they have automated tools, sometimes they don't. And a, a limitation in my view uh, is that you might be just selecting a bunch of controls without really knowing if they're needed. Um, sometimes people will just pick things because they think it might apply to their system. So you could be on the one hand selecting more controls than you needed and on the other hand, not selecting the ones you really need. So I, the bottom line, I think it can be used as, as a good support mechanism, but I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, using a standard framework as my sole uh, approach for threat modeling. Okay. Thank you for your presentation and answering the questions from the audience. So let's take a short break of one minute. And while taking a break, you can watch this video. Thank you so much, Dr. Maid. And we are going to have the presentation, uh, next presentation after one minute. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much as well. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. So, our next speaker is Dr. C.R.S. Kumar. Dr. C.R.S. Kumar is currently Professor in Computer Science and Engineering Department, Defense Institute of Advanced Technology, DRDO, Ministry of Defense. He has received PhD, MTech, MBA, BE degrees from reputed universities. His areas of research are in cybersecurity, augmented reality, virtual reality, game theory, and wireless networking. Dr. Kumar brings with him rich industry, research, and academic experience. Dr. Kumar has worked in leading MNC such as Philips, Infineon, Allen Key Infotech in senior positions. Dr. Kumar. Thank you for speaking for us today. 
I would like to hand over the mic to you. Thank you. Hello all, greetings to you. I thank uh, the organizers of this uh, event for giving me an opportunity uh, to present the talk on augmented reality and virtual reality for cybersecurity awareness training. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity and uh, we see that uh, the cybersecurity awareness is becoming a very important uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, protecting data as well as the systems from various type of threats and attacks. I am a senior member of IEEE and also Computer Society DVP speaker. I am from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. I work in the area of uh, cybersecurity, virtual reality, and uh, augmented reality. Here is the overview of the presentation. We have introduction, then um, a topic on virtual reality and augmented reality uh, with uh, more explanation about these technologies, how they play a role in education and how they can be used for training and uh, how they are impactful in their um, applications. Then we look at the um, topic of cybersecurity awareness, how it is important and what are the points which need to be elaborated and articulated. Then we also uh, bring in the topic of training and um, how we can make it effective by use of augmented reality and virtual reality. Then to summarize the presentation, I would like to uh, bring to your attention the fact that National Cybersecurity Awareness Month is being celebrated during October 2020. And uh, many activities around the world are going around regarding the spreading of awareness of the cybersecurity. The only source of knowledge is experience, said famous scientist Albert Einstein. We know Albert Einstein uh, from the theory of relativity uh, in 1905, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. And in this regard, we can see that uh, his uh, statement has uh, a very uh, importance in the sense that uh, people appreciate that uh, the experience plays a very important role in importing knowledge and generating new knowledge. Virtual and augmented and uh, mixed reality technology even though they have been available for several years, but it is only recently that uh, uh, we are seeing they're uh, being used extensively. Uh, since 2016, many handsets, headsets are available and many of the products are commercially available also. Research products are in progress, which are very exciting. What is virtual reality? So most of you may be aware of the term virtual reality, but uh, from an informal perspective, it's a computer generated interactive 3D environment in which a person can get immersed. And um, the three important terms connected with this is virtual, interactive, the system is interactive in the sense that the people can uh, um, manipulate many of the objects and environment around them. And it is immersive. The total, all the senses are occupied by the virtual reality experience. Then we have the augmented reality. That is, uh, it supplements the real world. You are seeing the real world. And along with that, the various computer generated virtual images, objects, are being projected and to appear and coexist in the same space as the real world. So this is a slide which shows the 
National Cyber Security Awareness Month and various activities being planned in different weeks of the month of October. And uh, we see that uh, the uh, importance that uh, cybersecurity awareness is getting over a period of time and many aspects of cybersecurity are being focused uh, to bring awareness to the uh, general public that uh, computers, even though we require them for every other activity, should be carefully used and one should be watching out for the kind of uh, threats which are there and uh, take precautionary measures, preventive measures, and uh, that way we can be safer. Okay, so one of the important thing about virtual reality and augmented reality is that they are considered as the fourth wave of the technological innovation and change in the world of the computing. What we see is that in the first wave, we had personal computers coming in and they had enormous impact on the usage of the computers around the world. Then we had internet, which interconnected uh, the various uh, people and entities across the globe. Then the third way was the mobile technology. So we can see that uh, um, during this uh, three waves, we had uh, like uh, got used to the these technologies. Now we see that the fourth wave, which is coming in, Okay, how does it impact us in the next 10 to 20 years to come? And how will it affect the people? Where does the learning with this new technology fit? So here is a diagram which shows the mixed reality with uh, the two extremes. That is, on the left extreme, we see the real environment as you see and as you experience. And the, on the right extreme, we see the virtual environment where we are totally immersed in the um, images and the audio which is uh, being uh, projected to us. All our senses are being occupied by the virtual uh, reality headset. So in the... Uh, in this um, range, we have also the augmented reality, which comes uh, somewhere in between. That is, there is a part of reality and there is a part of virtuality. Also, we have augmented virtuality, where majority of it is virtual um, images and uh, objects being projected, and the combination of real and the virtual um, objects. So what can VR and ER offer the education? So we see that uh, uh, for the effective education, we bring in many technologies. We um, use computers, we use various type of uh, software, and uh, like uh, we provide the uh, personnel for training uh, with uh, all this um, particular facilities in order to sort of make it more effective in their learning. So virtual reality by pure definition can deliver experiences and interactions for users that are either not practical or not possible in the real world. So this is uh, something extraordinary which we can expect from the technology of virtual reality. It provides an unparalleled way to immerse and captivate people of all ages. So it is uh, something which is uh, uh, what we can use in a different way than the personal computers and the 
laptops, mobiles, tablets, and all these technologies. Virtual reality helps the users feel immersed in an experience, uh, gripping their imagination and stimulating thoughts in ways not possible with traditional books, pictures, or videos, and facilitates a far higher level of knowledge retention. So uh, there are uh, some uh, examples where the virtual reality has been shown to provide retention of knowledge up to 90%. So uh, uh, this is one thing which is uh, very appreciative of this particular technology, if it is used in the right direction. Enhancing and extending learning experience is at the heart of what virtual reality can offer users and possibly is uh, one of the most powerful of all the technologies that could help change how we learn forever. So it is going to come, it's going to come and stay with us for longer duration and provide us a kind of experience in learning that is we had not uh, thought about before. Here is a small diagram which I took from the one of the famous books uh, that is uh, uh, showing that uh, in a real classroom, a teacher may be connected with one student at a time, whereas in a virtual reality environment, if supposing a teacher is speaking and the student feel as though the teacher is connected with the student. So this is one thing which we see is a possibility which is uh, something not possible in the real environment, which can be achieved through virtual reality. So it provides immersive, engaging experience. So people can visit places such as Moon, Mars, and they can get into the blood vessels of the humans, they can see the heart, and they can see the structure of the atoms, depth of the ocean, they can experience all this. Um, and they can uh, get the first-hand information, they can generate empathy, they can interact with these creatures such as dinosaurs, uh, which uh, uh, they have never seen in their lifetimes. So with virtual reality, we can put children and people in uh, simulated even dangerous like earthquake scenarios or whatever, and uh, compromising situations, and uh, in places they should never have to experience in the real world. And from this, they can learn empathy, safety, and emotion, and gain an understanding that is simply unobtainable, unobtainable from traditional media. Imagine the emotion understanding and emotional experience a user could gain from standing in the trenches during the World War I. So this is uh, something which is uh, able to be delivered to the virtual reality. So the most important point that we can look at is the increased knowledge retention through the use of virtual reality and augmented reality for training. So virtual reality provides one of the most important aspects of learning that no other technology can match, that of experience. As we already uh, discussed about uh, Einstein's statement that uh, knowledge is uh, gained through the experience, so also we can um, uh, bring in the context of Edgar Dale who theorized that we retain our 10% of what we read, but 90% of what we experience ourselves. So this experience can be delivered through the virtual reality. This is called as cone of experience by Edward Dale. And this also uh, brings support for bringing in virtual reality for training. Virtual reality facilitates knowledge retention at the highest possible level through immersive and engaging personal experience. So bringing experience into classroom and engaging children of all ages and also the uh, people, users of the 
uh, let's say the various type of devices which are to be um, connected to the internet. So it holds a potential to truly transform the knowledge retention. So how will it help enhance learning? So the one is that uh, the technology should assist the teaching community in uh, delivering the learning experiences. So how it can aid us and how we can effectively utilize it in delivering the kind of training and education. So there are clear educational benefits to be drawn from the use of virtual reality. Um, so already I've given you the points by Edgar Dale and Albert Einstein. So it provides better engagement, increased stimulation, and decreased learning time, and uh, enhanced knowledge retention. So all uh, these uh, benefits we can see. So also it offers a chance for many students to experience the technology for first time. So um, ap apart from getting, let's say, exposure to the cybersecurity awareness program, they are also experiencing the virtual reality as such, and they are coming to know about this technology, how it can work. And um, so it, it also can capture their imagination and also catch their attention. So what we see is that the distraction is one of the most important uh, factors which uh, can decrease the learning experience. So this virtual reality can hold their attention for longer duration. So it's also making it exciting to learn. So, so it offers a change to the traditional use of information communication technologies uh, such as uh, computers and laptops, um, additional usage scenarios and inclusion in learning activities not previously associated with the ICT. So, but um, there are concerns regarding use of virtual reality. Um, it is not that uh, what we uh, give all the benefits that uh, are going to be delivered without any side effects. So there are some concerns regarding virtual reality that um, uh, it can cause uh, issues related to health, safety, to emotional well-being. So there are many important factors to consider such as long-term effect on users' vision because they are going to be immersed and the display is going to be very closer to the eyes. And it may also, in this pandemic, uh, be, we need to be careful that uh, the same headsets are not being uh, reused uh, uh, without sanitization that will further okay, uh, spread the diseases. Then um, also it can um, have an impact on the emotional development of children. Um, due to the immersive and sensory manipulation. So we need to have careful consideration um, to various issues. And uh, we have to have strategies in place to address them before the equipment can be purchased and also deployed for using in the training. Here I have shown you the diagram of the various symptoms arising out of the virtual reality sickness. This is a term which is used for various uh, side effects uh, due to the long usage of the virtual reality headsets. So you see that various type of symptoms and uh, these may be due to various uh, um, particular technological limitations or due to mismatch in the delivery of the content. So suppose that we go ahead further that uh, the uh, project on using virtual reality for 
cybersecurity awareness can be deployed. We can set up a lab and have many type of uh, VR headsets and uh, control devices, and uh, then we can have software to be deployed on them so that people can use and uh, get awareness programs. But we need to have uh, to answer these uh, questions while going ahead with the implementation. How do we find the right equipment? How and manage them? How do we integrate into our lessons and the curriculum? What training is required for our teachers and instructors to use it effectively. So this is a new technology which is coming in and we have to address these questions and uh, what ongoing support and training is available and many companies are in fact developing various type of um, applications to be running on the headsets and uh, these need to be considered. How can we measure the success and outcome from using it? So. What are the metrics we need to be using and how do we compare it with the traditional techniques to deliver the training? So we need to have a clear plan uh, to pursue the research and procure and install um, and use the particular equipments and measure their effectiveness. So there are many uh, possibilities here. The VR headsets are available from various uh, commercial vendors and uh, there are many headsets which are under research which may not be easily available. But uh, what we see is that the best technology is already available in the market and uh, in this regard we can see the headsets such as Oculus Rift. So this is one of the first uh, commercially available VR headsets and I think it is being offered by Facebook. So Oculus is an integrated headset that requires tethered connection to an external PC. So in fact, it is a gaming device actually, and it is being recast as the training equipment. So the content available for Oculus Rift is limited, but surely there is, can be pushed towards uh, developing new content then we have HTC Vive. So it is backed by the mobile maker HTC. So it is integrated VR headset driven by a Windows PC or Mac. And uh, why predominantly targets the gaming market. So what we see is that currently the trend in VR is towards gaming, but surely the uh, education and training part is the one which can leverage it further. So uh, recently, there was, uh, in fact, uh, STC Vive also have started targeting education sector. Then we have Samsung Gear. So it is in collaboration with the Oculus and Samsung Gear VR combines Samsung mobile phone with the active headset to deliver high quality VR experience. So then we have various other headsets such as um, Google Cardboard and uh, you name it. So here is a video I would like to play for you regarding the headset. Okay, then we come across the augmented reality headsets. So we have the Microsoft HoloLens, which is one of the market leaders in this. And um, it is using optical see-through HMD, head-mounted device. And uh, it's most 
advanced VR headset with Windows 10 computer. So another uh, augmented reality headset is from Apple. So here is a small video from the Microsoft HoloLens, which I'm going to play for you. Okay, that is a short video which I uh, intended to play. I suppose uh, it came out properly for you. Then uh, we now come to the topic of cybersecurity in more detail. We want to explore it from understanding what may be the training requirement for creating awareness. So the cybersecurity is art of protecting networks, devices, and data from all access or criminal use and the practice of ensuring confidentiality, integrity, availability of the information. So in fact, uh, when we look at the use of computers, it is ubiquitous. We require computers, we require internet for everyday activity. We can see that uh, uh, the computers are required for communication, like uh, we may use it for uh, sending emails, receiving emails. Then um, we use smartphones, which are themselves computers, then tablet PCs. We may do messaging. We may do WhatsApp using them for communication. Then we can use computers for entertainment. Supposing we can use it them for interactive video games, social media, and various type of applications. Then we may use for navigation systems in transportation. So extensively for online shopping and uh, use of credit cards for e-transactions. There are medical equipments which are built around computers and um, various type of medical records like patient history, patient treatment, and uh, the x-rays and other kind of records are stored in databases. So we have aerospace applications, we have defense applications, and many, many applications. We can see that computers are part and parcel of our everyday activity. So in this regard, cybersecurity, we can say, is the fifth domain of warfare. That is, we have ground, then ocean, then sky as third domain, and space as fourth domain, and fifth domain is cyber domain. So the security of the cyber domain is by the cybersecurity. So there are various risks existing in the cyber domain. Um, one is the malware or virus and the uh, worms which can be infecting computers and then uh, they can uh, even um, um, reduce the data into um, like uh, they can distract the data or they can um, um, sort of uh, also bring in uh, some errors in uh, computations. Then um, while uh, the attackers, they use the computers and attack various type of um, uh, possibilities, like they may even take over our computers and uh, use them for attacking others. And um, this possibility is also existing attackers stealing the various type of um, credit card information and uh, making unauthorized uh, purchases. 
So there is no guarantee that even with the best precautions, so some of these things uh, uh, won't happen to you, but uh, there are steps you can take to minimize these chances. So take no chances. So with respect to cyber war, we have to reduce our risks and um, in, improve our confidence level in uh, using various technologies. Of course, we have to use them and we should not be troubled by various possibilities of losing the data or uh, uh, getting into some other issue. So the objectives of cybersecurity here are that uh, confidentiality, integrity, and awareness. So with respect to the confidentiality, we have two variations, that is data confidentiality and privacy. So in data confidentiality, we assure that private or confidential information is not made available or not disclosed to unauthorized individuals. So we may have various levels of confidentiality such as top secret, highly confidential, and uh, then we look at privacy. It assures that individuals control or influence what information related to them may be collected and stored, and by whom, and is uh, to whom the information may be disclosed. So, uh, so privacy need to be guarded. Then we have integrity. So we come across data integrity and system integrity. So data integrity is about assuring that information and programs are chained only in a specified and authorized manner. So even a bit of data being changed or a bit of uh, program being changed will affect its function. So data integrity plays a very important role. Then we have system integrity. So whether a system is intact so it assures that system performs its intended function in an unimpaired manner, free from deliberate or inadvertent unauthorized manipulation of the system. So uh, what we observe is that uh, the viruses and worms may even degrade the system integrity because uh, some of the programs may not be uh, functioning as they are expected to, then we look at the availability. That is, assuring that system work properly and uh, service is not denied to the authorized users. So supposing when we look at uh, ATM machine, when we want to withdraw a particular amount of money, so if the uh, let's say the ATM machine is not able to deliver that particular service, then we say that it is not available at that particular point of time. So the three objectives play a very important role. We can see that we can add uh, authentication, access control to this list. So when we look at the um, breach of security, so there are many levels of impact we can observe. The impacts can be low or moderate or higher. So the uh, kind of uh, the breach can result in uh, various type of uh, various levels of impact. And uh, supposing when you look at uh, high impact, it can cause various damages to the systems and it can lead to loss of lives, it can also uh, create uh, obstruction for the operation of an organization, or it can lead to catastrophic adverse effects on organizational operations and organizational assets being uh, compromised. So the moderate level, when we look at it, loss could be expected to have a serious adverse effect on organizational operations than organizational assets or individuals. 
that may have no impact. So supposing you may lose a particular file or which is not very important or the uh, organizational activities are obstructed for a few minutes or we can recover quickly. Okay, loss could be expected to have a limited adverse effect on the organizational operations. So when we look at the various challenges we are facing in cybersecurity domain, so we have a list of them here in this particular slide. And what we observe is that uh, security is not simple. So this statement is very important because we see that complexity of the systems is growing day by day. So there are many new features, functionalities being added to the systems, making them much more complex. And in that way, security is not simple. It, it is involving many aspects, many steps involved there. So the potential attacks on the security features need to be considered. So there are uh, possibilities which need to be taken into account. So procedures used to provide particular services are often counterintuitive. That is, that we see that uh, supposing a particular procedure which needs to be followed for the implementation of security, it seems to me that uh, uh, it is not logical or whatever, but rather it is uh, when you give a deeper thought, it all is uh, correctly implemented, but uh, it is uh, not obvious sometimes. It is necessary to decide where to use the various security mechanisms. So for example, we may have a firewall to be placed at a particular uh, point of the network. So if it is placed somewhere else, the firewall may not be effective at all. So then we have intrusion detection systems, then we have honey parts, then various devices, and also the multi-level authentication, multi-factor authentication, which may be required at certain places. So we have to use these mechanisms at various places. Then it requires constant monitoring. So supposing we need to, at any point of time, trace the attack or pinpoint any events taking place in the network or systems, then we have to have a logging mechanism. So it requires constant monitoring. So it's too often an afterthought. So what we observe is that uh, only when an attack is successfully launched, we realize that we should have done a particular uh, mechanism. We should have placed a particular uh, firewall or an intrusion detection system or honeypot for that matter. So this becomes an afterthought. Security mechanisms typically involve more than particular algorithm or protocol. What we see is that um, it is not just one algorithm or it is not just one protocol, rather it is a combination of them. Supposing when you look at uh, HTTPS protocol, it is a combination of HTTP and SSL TLS. Then what we see is that when you look at the SSL itself or TLS itself, it consists of um, encryption and hashing and many other algorithms inbuilt into it. So security is essentially a battle of wits between perpetrator and the designer. So the challenge, what we see is that uh, uh, when we see the attackers and defenders, attackers are coming out with new novel way of attacking the systems and defenders are now realizing the uh, vulnerabilities and covering them. So the attackers are trying to get ahead with uh, coming out with new techniques of attacks. And the in this way, what we see is that it is always uh, that uh, we have uh, the uh, looping there. To, so the uh, whole uh, scenario is that uh, each of the attacker and defender is trying to be one step ahead. And in that regard, this, uh, in fact, uh, it is also leading to the growth in the particular cybersecurity domain. 
um, indirectly the attackers or the contributors, but surely that is not an expected thing that uh, the 100% system cannot be in place at any point of time. There are the complex systems can have one or the other vulnerability opportunities which are exploited by the attackers. So little benefit from the security investment is pursued until a security failure occurs. So what we observe is that um, sometimes the security mechanisms seem to be very expensive or they seem to be um, much difficult to obtain or implement. And uh, in this regard, uh, there is a lack of uh, perception regarding the um, usefulness of that kind of security mechanisms. So only when security failure occurs, we realize the absence of the particular security device, which could have prevented this. So this is a very important uh, consideration. So strong security is viewed as an impediment to efficient and user-friendly operations. So many times we disable the password, thinking that it is one step uh, which can be reduced in our work, but uh, it is uh, actually a setback in terms of security. So we see that, uh, let's say, a person is disabling the firewall, a person is disabling a spam filter, thinking that system is slowing down. So we see that uh, these kind of activities can in fact uh, lead to the uh, attacker being successful in, in launching the attack or possibility of the virus infection or malware doing its damage. So we see with respect to various challenges that cybersecurity awareness plays a very important role. People who are in a position to sort of know what can be effective measure are, in a, are able to prevent many type of attacks and protect the systems. So cybersecurity awareness refers to how much end users know about cybersecurity threats, the network phase, and the risk they introduce. So one of the important uh, consideration is that humans are the weakest link in the particular uh, one network or system. Supposing when we consider the socio-technical systems, which consist of computers, networks, and also humans, who are the persons who are operating these systems and networks. So what we see is that humans are the weakest link because you want to uh, like say a person uh, disclosing a password or compromising a particular operation can result in the uh, entire network being uh, um, attacked or whatever. So organizations allot funding to protect their network from outside threats and reduce vulnerabilities. So being that end users are a major vulnerability Technical means to improve the security are not enough. So you may have various technical uh, systems, like such a uh, firewall and um, uh, various other things and plays, like you might have created a very powerful demilitarized zone and uh, installed various systems and uh, also protected the systems through various type of anti-virus and anti-spyware and you name it. Then, uh, so being that end users are a major vulnerability, so organization must also provide training for the personal awareness, awareness of cybersecurity. So uh, the uh, awareness actually strengthens the system. They should educate employees to current threats and how to avoid them. So uh, this is a important uh, point here. So cybersecurity awareness, what do we mean by this term and what all it is uh, involved, like how much depth a person should be having in uh, being aware of various type of issues here. So uh, we need to bring in awareness about threats, attacks and vulnerabilities, the threat agents, then various type of attacks which are uh, 
where people may not recognize it and walk into the trap, such as peer phishing, which is a, a email crafted and sent to a specific person to whom it may appear to be legitimate. So the person may think that, okay, this email is for me and let me click it. Okay, like the link may be activated and that results in the disclosure of some information which is useful for the attacker. Then we have phishing, then uh, social engineering. So this is a term which is uh, extensively used in cybersecurity domain. And uh, social engineering is where the uh, weakest point in the system, that is humans are being uh, uh, conned into disclosing information. So, Supposing an administrator may be called for a game and in that game, the person may uh, request the password and without the uh, this thing, no? like the consequences, the person may disclose it. That's a kind of social engineering attack. Then we have the ransomware attacks. So the recent ones which may lock up your system and uh, seek a ransom for that. So then we have distributed denial of service attacks. So these attacks, what we see, are that uh, even the legitimate computers are compromised and they are taken over and by the attacker to participate in this particular type of attacks. So uh, these are going to be making the legitimate systems unavailable for the end users. So they may bring down a web server or they may bring down an application server making it unavailable. So an end user who is trying in cybersecurity awareness will have the ability to recognize those types of attacks and avoid them. So that's where the cybersecurity awareness plays a very important role. So the cybersecurity training uh, that is uh, towards the awareness is uh, that uh, can greatly enhance the information assurance posture of an organization. So there are many approaches, uh, such as formal training sessions, then um, uh, passive computer-based and web-based training. So then a strategic placement of awareness messages, so banners and posters may be uh, placed at uh, various places, strategic places, that where people can be uh, viewing them and getting to know about these particular cybersecurity messages. Then interactive computer-based training, so this involves some kind of interaction such as uh, user giving some feedback or user answering a question. Then we come across gamification, that is video games have been proposed as an engaging training vehicle. So in fact, uh, there is a video game like tool called Cyber Siege, which has been employed to develop security awareness training so in this direction, what we see is the role of VR AR in cybersecurity awareness. So let me sort of uh, give a brief about the Cyber Siege. Cyber Siege is from the Naval Postgraduate School and it can be freely downloaded. And uh, this is one of the exciting tools in this domain which uh, can uh, be uh, useful for learning various uh, topics in cybersecurity. And uh, it's uh, also providing in the form of a game where a person can uh, view the layout of the network, see the animated characters interacting, see the placement of servers and various type of devices in the network. So when we look at the cybersecurity awareness activities, so here we see that uh, the first activity is introductory information assurance briefing. This is uh, followed by the information value uh, discussion that 
the stresses on the values of various type of data assets, access control mechanisms, then uh, we can discuss about social engineering. Then we look at the password management. So here, multi-factor authentication, the setting of powerful passwords and uh, various act things can be discussed. Then uh, malicious software and uh, uh, such as virus and the uh, worms can be discussed and uh, basic uh, safe computing practices can be uh, provided there. Then we have safeguarding the data. So how do we go around uh, ensuring the data protection? What mechanisms can be used here? Then physical security mechanisms. Supposing we have a term called workstation hijacking. So how a person can prevent this? This kind of simple measures can be articulated here. So in this slide, I'm discussing about uh, how the VR and ER can play a role in cybersecurity awareness training. It plays a significant role in enhancing training value through experiential learning and role plays. So we can create various artificial scenarios where the user can uh, navigate themselves and uh, can get immersed in the uh, environment and then they can see the uh, particular implications of their activities. Then um, it is an attractive alternative in holding the total attention of the trainees and it is free from distractions. So a person who is immersed in the virtual reality, augmented reality systems can uh, uh, sort of learn the particular topics with more effectiveness. It is nowadays inexpensive and uh, the headsets are easily available off the shelf. Knowledge and skills can be imported with good retention for trainees, as we already discussed this point earlier in our discussion, uh, presentation. So there can be better visualization through animations. There can be multimedia embedded in the particular applications. And also we can uh, do the gamification of concepts so that uh, a person enjoys the experience of learning the uh, particular package of training. So I'm coming to the final slide about the conclusion here. So uh, that uh, one is that uh, if properly implemented, virtual reality can be an incredible learning tool and uh, can help the users through complex topics. So empathization and uh, understanding emotion and give them a view of amazing world in which we live unlocking uh, creativity and imagination. So this uh, creates a foundation for success. We are truly is groundbreaking technology with so many ways to help augment uh, traditional teaching methodologies and make a fundamental impact on the students and uh, general public to learn and retain the knowledge. So Understanding how virtual reality and augmented reality can fit into traditional training environment should be fundamental concern here. So well-conceived and properly executed plan regarding use of VR and AR in training process. So this can um, deliver incredible results. So cybersecurity training uh, is very important and uh, we have uh, seen the uh, concerns regarding cybersecurity and how it can impact. And uh, in this regard, it can be delivered effectively using VR, ER. So VR, ER technologies uh, are coming out with new innovations that can be leveraged in delivering immersive training programs to the users. So I would like to acknowledge various references which I've used in my particular presentation here. And uh, these references uh, 
are uh, easily available for from the various internet sources. The sources for many diagrams and uh, points have been derived from these sources like classvr.com, securitycoincident.io, then NPS CyberSeach. You can even download the tool from there. Then we have the famous book on network security essentials by William Stallings. Then uh, Virtual Reality by Stephen Lavelle. And uh, some uh, resources are available from National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. There are many other references which are easily available. One is Security and Privacy, uh, the magazine from the IEEE, which is a very useful source. So I thank uh, you all for participating in this particular session. and. Um, I thank the organizers for giving you an opportunity. Now I am open for the questions. Okay, let's take a few questions from the audience. So I am pushing the questions to the slide area. So the question is, how is the cybersecurity objectives confidentiality, integrity, availability, different from other media like movie delivery or other IoT communication? Okay, so this question is that um, what whether confidentiality, integrity, availability are applicable for all these mediums like movie delivery or IoT communication? Of course. One is uh, supposing we see the latest attacks like uh, huge amount of uh, movies were stored in computer disks and the, somebody stole them uh, through various type of attacks. Okay, so uh, that is an example of Sony recently happened. And uh, here we see that uh, confidentiality, integrity plays an important role. The movies and the data regarding them and uh, storage of them, then, uh, IoT communication, that is uh, where the um, IoT devices have to communicate. Here also what we see is that uh, various types of attacks are possible. And uh, in this regard, uh, confidentiality, uh, integrity, and the availability of the device itself becomes uh, basic. So these, uh, I think, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability are the basic tenets of the cybersecurity. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, end users need to be aware of cybersecurity when using any technology. Does VR require awareness unique to VR? I think uh, VR usage has now penetrated general public like Many people, uh, like uh, at the basic level, they are aware of what the VR. So additional awareness may not be required, but surely the new generation, supposing they are not exposed to this technology, they can also appreciate the usage of VR. And, uh, and like through this medium, we may deliver the training content for cybersecurity. Okay, the next question, it's either a comment and then a question from the same participant. So the bottleneck to educational adoption will be cost of headsets and video generation hardware. So the question is. Okay, so uh, I don't see it as a bottleneck. Yeah. Okay, the other challenge is cost of production. What is the prognosis on the time frame these two costs, costs will make the general education access possible? Uh, what I observe is that uh, supposing when you look at the important topic of uh, cybersecurity awareness, okay, the cost of production can be justified uh, given that uh, it has uh, such a high impact, like uh, it can improve the confidence level and it can uh, prevent certain type of attacks which can uh, disturb the networks and computers. So I it is always justified and the cost is not very high at all. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. C.R.S. Kumar, for, for your great presentation about cybersecurity awareness. Um, before ending this session, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Nancy Merritt and Dr. C.R.S. Kumar, and also to our audience. The conference next session will be today, 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The session is, is on access control in touchless society. If you are interested, this presentation or any of the upcoming sessions of the conference, or you haven't already registered, you can find the information about this from our conference website. Thank you, guys. Have a nice time. See you in the next session.